This morning I'm going to be teaching on the rapture. Now, for some people, this is a very scary subject. Just the thought of people instantly vanishing and others being left behind is overwhelming for them. But I need to teach on it so you'll understand what happens to our soul and to our body when we die. You see, when a person dies, their soul is temporarily separated from their body. I say temporarily because one day their body will be resurrected and it will be reunited with their soul. But that doesn't happen until the resurrection. So I want to talk about what it's like during that time period when the soul is separated from the body. Think about it. What's it like for those who have died and their souls in heaven but their bodies in the ground waiting to be resurrected? What's it like for those who have died and their soul is in hell? Are they aware of what's going on around them? Can they feel pain? Can they see? Can they hear? Well, I want to talk about that. But before I do that, I need to make sure that everyone understands the doctrine known as the rapture. Now, I don't want to assume that everyone knows what the rapture is. Maybe there's some of you that have not grown up in church. You've not even heard of the word. So I want to explain in very simple terms what the rapture is. The rapture is an event that could happen at any moment. In a split second, every person who's ever trusted in Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, both the living and the dead, will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And they're taken to heaven to be with the Lord forever. Now, that's a very simple explanation of what the rapture is. But I need to add something so that you won't be confused. The rapture is a completely different event than when Jesus comes back to the earth. You see, Jesus is going to come back to this earth after a seven-year period known as the Great Tribulation. During the tribulation, God is going to pour his wrath upon the earth. He's going to pour his wrath upon those who weren't raptured. In other words, those who were left behind. But those who were raptured won't have to endure the wrath of God when it's poured out upon this earth because they're going to be it in heaven with the Lord. So don't confuse the rapture with the second coming of Jesus Christ. They are two different things. The rapture occurs before Jesus comes back to this earth. Now, depending on whether you're pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib, depends on how soon the rapture occurs before the second coming of Jesus Christ. It could be seven years if you're pre-trib. It could be three and a half years if you're mid-trib. Or it could be about 21 days if you're post-trib. But the rapture occurs before Jesus comes back to this earth. Now, when the rapture occurs, Jesus does not come to the earth. We meet the Lord in the air. In his second coming, he comes back to stand upon this earth. Now, every once in a while, I'll hear a person make this comment. I don't believe in the rapture. In fact, the word rapture isn't even in the Bible. Well, let me just tell you right up front. That is a very stupid statement. And let me explain why I say that. Our Bible is a translation from the original languages, Hebrew and Greek, into our language, which is English. So just because the word rapture isn't used in our English translations doesn't mean it isn't taught in the Bible. It only means that we didn't choose to use that specific word when we were translating the Bible into English. In fact, did you know that the words Trinity, Bible, and Grandfather aren't in our English translations? Well, I should say in our King James Version because now we have other translations. We have the New American Standard. We have the uh, NLT. We have the NIV. We have the American Standard Version. We have the Revised Standard Version. There's so many different translations. But I want you to understand something. The reason there is is because we go back to the original languages and we're trying to be so accurate when we translate it into our English. But... My point is this, the words Trinity, Bible, and Grandfather aren't in our King James Version. But just because the word Trinity isn't in the King James Version doesn't mean it isn't taught in the Bible. And just because the word Grandfather isn't used doesn't mean that there isn't such a thing as grandfathers. There is. Abraham was Jacob's grandfather. Isaac was Joseph's grandfather. But the word Grandfather wasn't used when we translated the Bible into English when we talk about 1611 in the King James Version. But when they translate, instead of using the word grandfather, they use the word father. Father could refer to your biological father, or it could refer to your biological grandfather, or even your biological great-grandfather, and you get the idea, great-great-grandfather, great-great-great-grandfather. 
But here's the thing that I want you to understand. If I use the same reasoning that opponents of the rapture do, I'd have to say that I don't believe in the Trinity, grandfathers, or the Bible because they aren't mentioned in the King James Version. Now, people, that's stupid. And I'm sure some of you are thinking, well, boy, Pastor Allen, you don't have any tact, do you? Well, tact or no tact, it's a fact. So if it's a fact, I'm going to state it that way. So where did the word rapture come from? Well, it's time for a little history lesson. One of the places where the rapture is taught is in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. Read along with me as I read this passage. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall ever be with the Lord. Now that phrase, caught up, is translated from the Greek word harpazo. And harpazo means to take suddenly or to snatch. Now, in the 4th century A.D., the great scholar Jerome translated the New Testament from the original Greek into Latin. His translation is known as the Vulgate. In fact, those of you coming to uh, Israel with me, when we go to the Church of the Nativity, right next to it is the cave where Jerome translated the Bible from Greek into Latin. We'll actually get to go to that cave if they're not having a service. Very few uh, tourists ever get to go there, but if you know how to get into it, you can, and we're going to try and do that. But anyways, his translation is known as the Vulgate. Now, when he came to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse number 17, he translated the Greek word harpazo into Latin with the word raptius, because the Latin word raptius means to take suddenly or to snatch. Well, our English word rapture comes from that Latin word. It means exactly what the Greek word harpazo means, which is to take suddenly or to snatch. So we use the word rapture to describe the doctrine that Paul was describing or teaching in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and also in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So even though maybe the word rapture isn't in there, It's what it means. It's the Greek word harpazo, and it means to be snatched up in the air. It means to be taken suddenly and to instantly be in the air. And that's where we got the term rapture. So let's study the doctrine that scholars refer to as the rapture. Now to me, the clearest and the most detailed description of the rapture is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. Let's read that whole passage of scripture if you don't mind. And now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died so you will not grieve like people who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. First, the Christians who have died will rise from their graves. Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on this earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage each other with these words. Now, let me give you a little bit of background information so you'll understand why Paul was teaching on this. Paul established the church of Thessalonica during his second missionary journey. While he was there, he taught extensively on some of the end-time events, such as the rapture, the second coming, and the Antichrist. Now, how would you have liked to have been at that prophecy seminar? Man, I would have paid anything to be at that prophecy seminar. But anyways, Paul didn't stay very long at Thessalonica because the Jews became very envious of the large crowds that he was drawing to his services, and they ran him out of town. So he went on to Berea, and then to Athens, and finally he went to Corinth. Now, while he was at Corinth, Paul received news that the church of Thessalonica was doing very well. It was growing strong, but there were some concerns. Since he had left, several members of the church had died, and that raised some questions among them. One of the questions that they had was what happened to the dead when the rapture occurred? Would they be raptured too, or would they be resurrected at a later date? 
So Paul wrote them a letter, which is 1 Thessalonians, and he wrote this passage about the rapture to clarify what he had previously taught them and to assure them that not only would the dead in Christ not miss the rapture, but they would rise first when it happened. So in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, Paul makes some very important points concerning the rapture. So let's look at the key points that Paul made. First of all, only believers will be raptured. Unbelievers will be left behind wondering what in the world happened to all of these people that vanished. Now, we might be shocked. By the time we get to the rapture, it might just be a few. Let's hope that there's more than just a few. But unbelievers who are left behind are going to be wondering what happened to the people around them that just instantly vanished. Look at the first part of verse number 14. It says, for since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again. You see, Paul is making it very clear. Only those who believe that Jesus died for their sin and was resurrected will be raptured. Those who don't believe will be left behind and they're going to have to face the tribulation. Jesus paints a picture of this in Matthew chapter 24 verses 37 through 42. You see, another one of the erroneous myths that opponents of the rapture come in and try to uh, tell everyone is that Jesus never taught on the rapture. People, that's just a blatant lie. Notice the picture that Jesus paints here in Matthew chapter 24, verses 37 through 42. When the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in Noah's day. In those days before the flood, the people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time Noah entered his boat. They laughed at Noah. They'd never seen rain before. They didn't believe that the whole earth was going to be flooded. People didn't realize what, it was, what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away. This is the way it will be when the Son of Man comes. Notice this. Two men will be working together in the field. One will be taken, the other left behind. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, the other left behind. So you too must keep watch for you don't know what day your Lord is coming. I know so many of you are caught up into these earthly things, these things that are temporal, that when I talk about the coming of the Lord, you say, that's not going to happen. They've been saying that for 2,000 years. Whew. I feel sorry for you because you're probably going to miss the rapture. The second key point that Paul made concerning the rapture is very interesting. He tells us that every believer who has died will come back with Jesus in order to be reunited with their resurrected body. Look at the last part of verse number 14. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. Now, some of you are probably thinking, but I thought that the dead were going to be raised at the rapture. Well, only the bodies are going to be resurrected. The soul doesn't have to be resurrected because it's already with Jesus in heaven, unless they're an unbeliever. In that case, their soul is in hell. Now, to help you understand what Paul's talking about, I need to explain what happens when a person dies. And I did that in the very first sermon in this series. So let me just give you this very quick synopsis of what happens. When a person dies, their soul is separated from their body. In fact, that's what death means. Death means separation. It does not mean annihilation or cessation of existence. So when a person dies, it doesn't mean that they cease to exist. It means that there is a separation between the material part, the body, and the immaterial part, which is the soul of that person. Now, if a person is a believer in Christ Jesus, their soul goes to heaven. If they're not a believer, then their soul goes to hell. But the physical body is buried. Now, Jesus gave us a good picture of this in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke chapter 16. So turn with me, if you would, to Luke chapter 16. But I'm just going to read a portion of that parable to illustrate what I'm talking about. Look at Luke 16. Let's read verses 22 and 23. Finally, the poor man died and was carried by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. His body was buried, not his soul. And his soul went to the place of the dead. 
there in torment he saw. His physical senses were working, and we'll talk about that next week. He saw Abraham in the far distance with Lazarus at his side. You see, the body was buried, but the soul of the rich man went to hell, and the soul of Lazarus went to be with Abraham. Now, some of you are probably thinking, what does it mean the soul went to be with Abraham? Well, you need to understand, at the time that Jesus was writing this, he had not yet died for our sins, and he had not been resurrected, and he had not ascended to heaven. So people who died before that time period couldn't go to heaven. Why? Their sins had not been paid for. But they believed that the Messiah was coming, so their soul did not go to hell. Their soul went to a place known as the bosom of Abraham. It was a temporary holding place until Jesus died for our sins and was resurrected. At that point, Jesus came and took those in the bosom of Abraham to heaven. He took captivity captive, as Ephesians tells us. So, the point that Paul is making is that when Jesus comes to rapture the church, those who have died will come with him in order to be reunited with their resurrected body. Let's read 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 4 through 18 again. And I want you to notice what Paul is saying. It says, For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, and he will, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. Who are the believers who have died? Everyone who's died and and who so went to heaven. They're with Jesus right now. So when Jesus comes back, all of the souls of those who believed in him will come back with him. Let's keep reading. We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with the commanding shout... With the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. First, the Christians who have died will rise from their graves. Now, wait a minute. I thought those who had died, those Christians who had died, their souls were in heaven. Yes, their souls are in heaven, but not their bodies. So when Jesus comes back, the souls of the living, those who believe in Jesus, come back with him. But their bodies are going to be resurrected to be reunited with their soul. So Paul's letting everyone know that at the rapture, the separation that occurred at death, the separation of the soul from the body is going to be reversed. The third thing that I think is important and that I want you to notice is the sequence of events. At the end of verse number 15 and all of verse 16, Paul lays out the sequence of events that will occur at the time of the rapture. The first thing that's going to occur is that the Lord himself will come for us. Look at verse 16. For the Lord himself. So as you can see, Jesus isn't sending an angel to get us. He's coming himself. Now, when Jesus comes back for us, three things are going to happen. First, Jesus himself will shout. Why? To wake the dead. He's going to give this commanding shout to let everyone know it's time to rise. Notice what Jesus said in in John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29. Don't be surprised. Indeed, the time is coming when all the dead in their graves will hear the voice of God's Son and they will rise again. Now, the word shout in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 16, is a very interesting word. It's translated from the Greek word kelusma. And it means to shout a command or to bark an order. In fact, in ancient times, it referred to a general who was shouting out orders or commands to his army. Secondly, there will be the call of the archangel. This call is for the command for the trumpet to be sounded. And number three, when he gives that command, the trumpet is going to sound. Now, in the scripture... Trumpets were used to assemble the people and to designate different commands. Let me give you an example. Look with me, if you would, in the book of Numbers, chapter 10, verses 2 through 7. It says, Make two trumpets of hammered silver for calling the community to assemble and for signaling the breaking of camp. When both trumpets are blown, everyone must gather before you at the entrance of the tabernacle. But if only one trumpet is blown, then only the leaders, the heads of the clans of Israel, must gather together. When you sound the signal to move on, the tribes camped on the east side of the tabernacle must break camp and move forward. When you sound the the signal a second time, the tribes camped on the south will follow. You must sound short blasts as the signal for moving on. But when you call the people to an assembly, blow the trumpet 
with a different signal. Now, the last trumpet, the one that Paul is talking about in verse 7, calls the people to an assembly. In other words, rise up, it's time together in the air with the Lord. Now, notice what Paul says in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, verse number 52. He's talking about the rapture. Notice what he says. It will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown, that trumpet to assemble the believers in the air with the Lord. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever, and we who are living will also be transformed. Now I want you to notice how quickly the rapture is going to occur, how fast it's going to happen. The NLT says that this will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye. Now, to give you an idea of just how quick this is or how fast this is, I want you to underline the word moment. Moment is translated from the Greek compound word atomos. Now, you know what a compound word is. We talk about that all the time. A compound word is a word that's made up of more than one word. In this case, it's made up of two words. It's made up of the root word tomos, which means to cut, and the privative alpha. Now, when you combine the privative alpha with the root word tomos, it literally means that which can't be cut or that which can't be divided. You see, to the Greeks, the atomos was the smallest particle of matter. In fact, our English word atom comes from this Greek word. Did you know that? It's transliterated from this Greek word. Now, when you apply this word to time, it means the smallest amount of time you can imagine. People, that's how quick the rapture will occur. Think about this. When the rapture occurs, people are gone. But that's too slow. So when I say that people will instantly vanish, I don't mean they're going to vanish just like that. I can't even snap. Anyways, that was better. Did you hear that? That's too slow. You're not going to see people float into the air. They're just going to be instantly gone. It's going to happen so quickly that you can't even see it. One minute they were there, the next they were gone. Now, turn back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse number 17. And let's look at the fourth key point. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall ever be with him. According to Paul... The dead will be resurrected, but those who who are alive won't be resurrected. Instead, they're going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Now, what does he mean by caught up? Well, as I said before, that phrase, caught up, is translated from the Greek word harpazo, which means to snatch or to take suddenly. So what Paul is telling us is that those who are alive and remain on the earth, when Jesus comes back, will be snatched from the earth to meet him in the air. They will be taken suddenly To meet Jesus in the air. So that's the fourth key point. Those who are alive won't be resurrected. They will be raptured. Did you catch what I'm saying? They will be snatched from the earth. They will be taken up instantly. Now to get a better picture of what's going to happen when this occurs, turn to 1 Corinthians 15, verses 52 and 53. You see, once, G- once Paul started teaching on this, he found that wherever he went, he needed to teach on this because people who believed in Jesus were dying. So he had to explain this event called the rapture. Notice what it says. It will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. And we who are living at the time will also be transformed. You see, when that trumpet sounds at the rapture, then the dead, those bodies that are decomposed, they're going to be transformed. They're going to go up into the air and reunite with their soul. But those of us who are living on the earth at that time, we're also going to be transformed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Notice what Paul says at the end of verse number 52. He says, we who are living will also be transformed. Now I want you to underline that word transformed. Transformed is translated from the Greek word alasso. And it means to change from one thing 
to another. So what Paul is saying is that our bodies are going to be changed from one thing into another when the rapture takes place. Now there's always those that say, well, what are we going to be changed into? And the other person responds, we really don't know. Well, that's not necessarily true. Because Paul gives us a little more detail about this transformation process in the book of Philippians. Now, did you catch what I'm saying? Not only did Paul teach on this, but Jesus taught on it. And Paul taught on this in the book of 1 Corinthians, in the book of 1 Thessalonians, and he also taught about it in the book of Philippians. So if you want to know a little bit about this transformation process, all you have to do is go to the book of Philippians. Look with me, if you would, in the book of Philippians, chapter 3, verses 20 through 21. It says, but we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives. And we are eagerly awaiting for him to return as our Savior. He will take our weak mortal bodies and he will change them into glorious bodies like his own. Using the same power with, with which he will bring everything under his control. Now I want you to notice what Paul is saying. He's saying when the rapture occurs... Our bodies are going to be changed from weak mortal bodies into glorious bodies just like his body. Like whose body? Like Jesus' resurrected body. Wow. We are going to have the same type of body that Jesus had when he was resurrected. Now what does that mean? Well, that means four things. Number one... It means that our resurrected body will consist of flesh and bone. You'll find this in Luke chapter 24, verses 39 through 40. When the disciples were afraid that he was just a spirit, he said, Touch me, I am flesh and bone. Feel me, handle me. Number two, we'll still eat food. You'll find this in Luke 24. When Jesus was resurrected, he ate a fish with them. Do you remember that? He was able to physically eat. Thank God for that. Only thing I can think of is in heaven, there won't be any calories. Number three, our friends and family will be able to recognize us. Look at Luke chapter 24, verse number 31. Jesus looked the same way as he did when he was on this earth. Now, some of you are hoping that you're going to be changed in your looks also. You're kind of hoping that you're going to have all that hair. Or maybe your nose isn't going to be that big. I don't know what's going to happen there, but I will say this. Your friends and your family will be able to instantly recognize you. You see, when Jesus was resurrected, they recognized him. They could tell, this is Jesus. And last but not least, our bodies won't be subject to the normal laws of time and space. Now, let me say that again because this is very important. Our bodies, these transformed bodies, the bodies that are going to be like Jesus' body, won't be subject to the normal laws of time and space. You see, on two separate occasions, Jesus went right through the wall of the room where the disciples were meeting. Go back and read Luke chapter 24, verse number 36, and John chapter 20, verses 19, and verse number 26. Jesus just seems to walk right through walls, but he's a physical body that you can touch and feel. On another occasion, he just vanished from sight. You'll find that in Luke chapter 24, verse number 31. That's why if you're inside of a car or inside of a building or down in a cave when the rapture occurs, you're going to go right through the ceiling. You know, every once in a while you'll have a child ask you when you're teaching on the rapture, that child will say, well, what happens if we're in this building and the rapture occurs? Are we going to go up and hit the ceiling and just keep bumping our heads? No! This resurrected body is not restricted to our laws of time and space. You'll just instantly go right through that ceiling. Now, up until the time of Paul, no one had taught on the rapture with the exception of Jesus. So it was what the Bible calls a mystery. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 51. Behold, I show you a mystery, a mysterion. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Now, you see that word sleep? Sleep is a euphemism. A euphemism is a nice way of saying something that we consider to be socially unacceptable. We don't say that Grandpa died or he kicked the bucket. We say that Grandpa passed away. That's much nicer. We don't say that that person had sex with this other person. We say they slept together. 
Why do we say those things? Because those are euphemisms. Those are a nicer way of saying things that is probably inappropriate in social circles. So the Bible uses a euphemism for death, and the euphemism it uses is sleep. Now this is interesting because next week when we talk about what it's like during that period when the soul is separated from the body. The souls of believers are in heaven, the souls of unbelievers are in hell, but the body is in the ground. So they're souls without bodies. Those souls are separated. We're going to talk about why sleep is used as a euphemism because it's a wonderful analogy as to what happens when those souls are separated from the bodies. But anyways, what I want you to understand is sleep is a euphemism for death. So notice what he says. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, or in other words, we shall not all die, but we shall all be changed. When Jesus comes back, there, there are going to be people on the earth, and if they're believers, they will never have to die because they're going to be transformed. They're going to be instantly snatched up into heaven. Their body, this physical body, is going to be transformed into a body that was like Jesus' resurrected body so they don't ever have to sleep or die. But I want you to notice this. Paul says that the rapture is a mystery. Now, let me explain what Paul means by mystery. A mystery in the New Testament is not some puzzle that has to be solved or unraveled. It's not even something that's hard to understand. It's a mystery, hard for people to understand. No, a mystery is a truth that has been hidden from previous generations, but has now been revealed. Let me give an example of a mystery in the Bible. Look at Colossians chapter 1, verse number 26. He says, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints. Do you see this? This is something that has been hidden from previous generations, or it's never been taught on. No one knows anything about it, but now it's revealed. That's a mystery. Now let me get back to the point I'm trying to make, which is this. The fact that believers would be raptured had never been taught until Paul taught on it, with the exception of Jesus, because Jesus taught on the rapture. It was a mystery, a totally new revelation that had never been revealed until Jesus talked about it and until Paul came along and he began, to t he began teaching on it and he also wrote about it in 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So I want you to understand that there's going to be an event called the rapture. And at that point, all of the souls that are in heaven are coming back with the Lord, and their bodies that are decomposing in the ground are already completely decomposed. Somehow, God is going to transform that body. He's going to resurrect it. Those bodies are going to go to the air to be reunited with their soul, and they're going to live with the Lord. Now, for those of us who are on the earth at the time that that event occurs, we will never die. And Jesus spoke about this in John the 11th chapter when he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those two are not synonymous. I am the resurrection for those who have died, and I am the life for those who will be alive when I come back and they're going to be raptured. They'll never die is what Jesus said. Why? Because their bodies will be transformed. Now, why in the world would I need to teach on this? Why does every Christian need to know about the rapture? Because we're living in a world where people die all the time. Now, when I first started this church, we mainly attracted younger people. I didn't do that many funerals. But I've been pastoring this church for almost 25 years. And those of you who've been with me for all that time, and now that I'm hitting 52, we're attracting older people. I do a lot more funerals now, and I do a lot of funerals even for young people. And whenever there's a funeral, these questions come up. Well, can my loved one who's passed away, do you think they can see us here on this earth? And you begin to explain that. And they say, okay, but are they in heaven right now? And their body's in the ground, what's the deal? And you start explaining it. Well, their soul is in heaven, but the body is decomposing in the ground. But one day that body's going to be resurrected. It's going to be reunited with their soul. And boy, that raises all types of questions. Really? Yes, really. Well, when's that going to happen? And you say, well, it's going to happen when the rapture occurs. And then they go, what's the rapture? Show me in the Bible. And this is where every Christian fails. They can't explain the rapture. They can't explain the sequence of events. 
And so that person that you're ministering to and you're getting ready to take them to the place where you can actually lead them to the Lord, all of a sudden it stops because they think, well, you don't even know what you're talking about. And you don't. You know, our great hope is, because of what Jesus has done, we will get to live with the Lord forever. We get to go to heaven. And the Bible says that we should, be will, or we should always be ready to give an explanation of the hope that is within us. And what is that hope? That when we die, we get to be with Jesus. But it's more than that. It's that one day our bodies will be resurrected, reunited with our soul, and we're going to have a body just like Jesus' resurrected body. But here's the problem. Most of us are not ready to give an answer, to give an explanation of the hope that is within us because we don't know what the Bible teaches about that. And people, let me tell you, that's what the, the Christian faith is all about. Because of what Jesus has done your sins are paid for and you get to go to heaven. But when these questions come up, and they will, and you're not ready to answer these questions, you miss the opportunity to bring people to Jesus Christ. Because when they start asking this about, where is grandma? What's going to happen to grandma? Is her soul in heaven? What about her body? You're saying that the body's going to be resurrected? What's going to take place? And when is that going to take place? You see, you can give all these answers and at the very end, you can say, you know what? The only way you're ever going to see your grandma again is you have the same faith that she did. You need to put your trust in Jesus Christ that he died for your sins and God raised him from the dead. And if you do that, I can show you in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, that those bodies are going to be resurrected, reunited with their soul, and they're going to live forever with the Lord. But the majority of people can't do that. And we miss the opportunity to win people to Jesus Christ.